body's need for speed I can put our wings in the wind faster than you could ever believe Why you ready to rock? From the don't ever stop We are on a crash course of freedom is running on as long as we want Hey Joel, thanks very much. So uh, Stu Smith here in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Thanks for the time with you, brother. Um, I know we talked a little bit about the show and how important this is to you. Uh, I think it's just a great format for us to get together and talk about things that are important uh, to each of us and for me to share a little bit about my experience. I think that's one of the cool things about uh, getting a little bit older is <laughs> you've got the opportunity to reflect and you right. actually have an obligation to share. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, we had talked a little bit about my background. So I was going to give you a, just a little bit. And I'm going to tell you the funny story that I alluded to, which is a funny thing happened on the way to the podcast. So since uh, 92, I've been helping my fellow veterans transition successfully from the military. And what that means to me is a lot of what we're taught in the American forces um, is through a program called the Transition Assistance Program, TAP. Right. Yep. Yeah, so you might be familiar with it. Um, a lot of it, most of it is good, but the pieces that are critical to successful transition are not there. Right. And that is what we I, I would call the secret, right? And so I actually today, uh, with some pride, announced that um, uh, my contribution to a book called 101 Lessons Helping Military Members and Veterans Achieve meaningful, lucrative post-service careers was just released on Amazon. Oh wow! So that, that's kind of why I, you know, I came to to, to chat with you and just um, uh, talk a little bit about that book and that secret in there. Because, Absolutely. Yeah, it's missing from those programs, and it's really not a secret. Right. And uh, <laughs> but it's something that people have to be reminded of all the time. And there are some techniques that you can use to overcome the limitations of what you get from the kind of the classic program. So that was, that was, the, was the purpose. So like I said, in 86, I, uh, I joined the military. Um, I love the phrase, um, I'm no hero, but I served with some. And I'd love to right. tell you a story about two, two dear friends that, that uh, took their own lives um, after a military career. But um, I served with some great folks. I went into service, I think how probably to be honest with you, 60% of guys went into service. Um, I got out of high school in the 70s. And uh, back then, maybe 20% of your class went to college. Um, <laughs> yeah, the rest of us went to work. Yeah. Uh, so I went to work and had a bunch of things that I liked to do. Uh, nothing was really making me any money. I tried to start a couple businesses in the construction industry and that failed miserably. And um you know, I kind of bounced around from job to job, just trying to find what it is that um, just turned me on uh, to life and, 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 and work. And, you know, seven years later, I woke up finding out that I was, uh, you know, A, divorced, uh, B, having to support a young daughter, yeah. um, uh, C, broke, and worse than anything, D, in debt. And so... Uh, I ran down to the recruiter because my dad had been in the service, uh, been in the Air Force. I ran down to the recruiter and I said, uh, or I asked him, hey, you know, what do you got for me? And uh, <laughs> so, I, so I ended up in the infantry. So and, and, and nothing fast. This is, this is pre 9-11. So the, the military was really all about opportunity. It was about, right. uh, you know, getting a steady paycheck and, and maybe getting an education and, and getting out with the GI Bill and hell, back then they had a bonus for going in the infantry. So um, I said, yeah, that, that would be great. I, I didn't even literally know what the infantry was, other than the fact that when I told my old man, he said, good God, son, you're going to be a ground pounder. <laughs> that, was his, that was his perception of- I'm surprised you um, told him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The Vietnam era vet. Well, he's, you know, uh, the old man's probably turning over in his grave, but uh, uh, he, he was shocked uh, when I went in the Army and my brother went in the Navy. But right. we- Long, long history in the military. You know, dad in the Air Force. My uncle was in the Air Force, Vietnam veteran. Never got over that experience. Uh, my wife's father uh, came from uh, Austria at the time. Had come over to America twice. Um, people don't think about immigration being different back then. But a quick story: him and Pop came over uh, the first time on a ship into Ellis Island. The, the record was there, 
And I asked dad, I said, dad, you know, why didn't you guys stay the first time you came over? And he's like, Stu, they didn't need us. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah. He said, Pop made the mistake when they were in processing at Ellis Island. They asked him, what skills did you have? And he said, hey, I am a carpenter. And they're like, we don't need carpenters. And oh. they literally told him to get back on the boat and go home. Wow. Wow. Was such a crazy story. It's like, we don't need what you have. So next time Pop comes over, he's smart, right? So he gets in the water. <laughs> And he's listening ahead and he's asking people, what are they asking for? What are they asking for? What are they asking for? And um, finds out that they're, they're asking for bricklayers. We knew oh, yeah. nothing about bricklaying. You know what I mean? But when yeah. he got in front of the line, that's what he was. So that's how, that's how yeah. dad got here. And because he was from Austria, he ended up in uh, the Japan war theater. Uh, amazing story was a tanker. Started out as a napalm gunner, basically shooting napalm in the uh, pillboxes and spent right. four years over there and literally came home without a, he didn't even tear a fingernail. Wow. Not a scratch. Um, four That's years. amazing. Yeah. So anyway, long military career. So went down to the recruiter, said, hey, you know, sign me up, get in the infantry. And and uh, um, away I went from there into a, a military career, six years, eight months, eight days. Wow. You know, not wow. that anybody was counting. <laughs> except uh, for, yeah except for you and your wife right <laughs> yeah. well actually you know the cool thing is i um i met my wife on active duty oh okay yeah so both of us are military and our our son is now serving active army also so uh, the right. legacy continues as it were oh that's yeah. that's a great thing that's a great thing um i want to talk to you about the transition from the military to civilian life and i want to kind of see where you feel that uh, most people require help when they're leaving the military. Is it at the point of, I don't want to use this term, but no return when it's the six months and there's they're, they're, they're now at a breaking point where they have to decide what they're going to do. Or do people tend to plan out a year, two years in advance of what their goals and accomplishments are going to be after they leave the military? Yeah. I think you just described the two camps. Um, and, 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 and again, in my experience, because I joined the military a little bit older, I had civilian experience. So I knew what the civilian world was going to be like when I got out. And to be right. honest, it was a huge advantage. It didn't really serve as a disadvantage to me in the military going in later, um, but it served as a huge advantage to me when I left the service. So I think a lot of younger folks, like first enlistment folks, uh, do themselves a disservice by thinking, you know, I'm going to do my four years and I'm going to take whatever the service provided for me, whatever training and education, you know, I'm going to turn that into a contractor job or, a, you know, $50,000 a year job. And they wait too long to prep because they don't know how. So the nice thing about tap is they're pushing tap farther upstream. Right. So instead of waiting, like when I worked for the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs, you might not go to tap until your last week on active duty. Wow. Now, now TAP is required way upstream. And, and there are times when service members are in there, you know, six months to a year, depending on where they're at um, station wise, uh, going into the TAP program. Yeah. But the, challenge, the challenge still for younger service members, uh, which is the, the largest group of people that get out of the service and do not go to work immediately are the younger men and women um, because there's no context. So even though they're sitting in tap and the person is talking about, you know, job search techniques and networking techniques and, you know, uh, services and resources and so on and so forth, there's no context to that. Um, right. Whereas if you've been in the civilian world and you went in the military a little bit later, at least you had a job or two. So you know what some of that stuff is all about. Um, and the more experienced folks and, and, and the more senior enlisted and uh, officer ranks, they get ready earlier. They know that they've got to transition successfully. Now think about it. You're, you know, you're 22 years old and you're getting out of the military. You've been a single guy or gal. Um, you've saved up a couple thousand bucks. Um, you're probably going to go right back home, right? Right. right. Home. And so you got some sort of support system. Hopefully, you know, might even go be, be going back to mom and dad's house for a little bit. And then you're going to figure out, but when right. you're, a mid-career NCO or officer, uh, you've got to prepare because now maybe you've got a family, uh, you know, you've got some obligations, um, 
and you've got to make a very successful transition very quickly. And to be honest, Joel, this is where I see a lot of these guys making mistakes because here's the, here's the classic mistake and it's, it's amplified in tap. So it, they're basically some premises. I almost call them lies, but I don't want to say lie because it's not intentional. There's these premises. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But they have, right? Yep. So, listen, um, take the first job you're offered. Right. Because you can always look for another job. Always upgrade. Terrible advice. Just terrible advice. Because these yep. guys, guys and gals will get out. And they'll take the first job that they're offered. And they'll be profoundly frustrated. Right. And just adds to the anxiety of the transition. So I've got, you know, mid career, I got some skills, I've got some experience. I took this job. It was terrible. Now I got to find another job. It's, it's worth it to be patient and prepared and find the job that you're looking for. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you some hints about how to do that. It's just a great story. Uh, a buddy that I helped um, named Steven and, um, it's easy steps, really easy steps. So that's the first thing. The second thing is they'll tell, especially mid-career uh, NCOs or officers, that what they did in the military doesn't really have value in the civilian world. And it's just the opposite is true. And unfortunately, the civilian world doesn't appreciate what military folks bring. So, you know, my job in the infantry was to, you know, the mission is close in with and kill the enemy. Yeah. There's not much of a call for that you know, right um although i can see that in the modern world today but no I'll leave the politics aside so yeah. there's not much call for that but there is call for uh, a young man who knows how to organize tasks who knows how to deploy resources who knows how to de um, make decisions uh, make hard decisions prioritize things so think about your 22 year old person getting out of service, assuming you went in with the 18, you might have made it E4, E5, yet significant responsibilities for people, equipment, supplies, materials, and the mission. Right. Right. And you're surrounded with people who are doing the same thing and are focused on the same thing. And now you're throwing in the civilian world where they tell you to sit down, shut up, and we'll tell you what we need from you. Right. Right. So now is that is that the stigma? Sorry, is that the stigma behind um, employers when they're hiring um, veterans where they don't really understand? They understand, like you said, they understand the title of what the individual did, but they don't understand all the meat and potatoes underneath it. Do you yeah. think that? that yeah, it's a two-way street too, Joe. Sorry, I did cut you off. It's a two-way street there too. So it's it's perceptions because it's not reality. Uh, and when I worked in Atlanta for, for Sherm and I did the big veteran transition program, I was helping educate my fellow human resource professionals on asking the right questions of military service members. And it was more so than the classic, tell me about your last job. But on the other side of the table, that soldier, airman, Marine, Coastie um, has to be able to translate what they did successfully. Right. Right. And I think, I think that I hear that a lot where veterans are going in for a job interview and I've actually had veterans come in to me and luckily enough, I can, I, I know what verbiage they're going to use, yep. but if they don't go see somebody like myself and they're using terminology or acronyms or whatever it is to describe what they did um, prior in the military, to me, it sounds like a great feature to have in anybody but to somebody who doesn't understand that that lingo or that jargon, they're going to see it as um, they're not going to understand what what they're getting as an employee. And to me, that's unfortunate. And I think that that's where the 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 learning process for the individual who's leaving the military has to learn. OK, I just have to switch up my words a little bit when I'm describing what I've done. Yeah. And it's uh, and that's another kind of challenge that tap and, and other transition organizations actually have a translation guide right if you did this in the military that equates to this in the civilian world but there's more of a nuance to it look let me let me give you an example i've got a buddy who spent 24 years in the navy and he was in the medical field but the unique thing about his experience was his entire career after his first enlistment so 20 years was in submarines. 
The unique thing about being a medic on a sub is you're the only medic on a really. Sub. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Fair enough. Carry on. <laughs> yeah. You're, the, you're the guy, right? Yeah. The, and so what my buddy had to translate was the significant, not, not the, the clinical stuff, because he actually got two jobs at two different medical clinics and washed out of both of them. Cause I was helping him with this transition Yeah. because he, he had such significant responsibility as the only that everybody depended on him to execute his job flawlessly. Right. And in addition to that, the unique thing about being the dot is you had to learn the different watches so that you could backfill. Right. And so what he had to do was unbundle all that stuff and, and talk to people about the responsibility of being the sole resource for an organization in a subject matter. And so when you start talking to human resource professionals and saying, listen, I was in a, in a unique environment in which I was the individual contributor. I was the only person with a skill set that I had. And oh, by the way, I had to learn other people's skill sets in order to be successful. That translates a lot better than saying I was a doc on a sub. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know? Now, for, for his position, though, you said he went over and he started working at other medical facilities when he was done. How did he work uh, along other people that were doing the same job as him now that he's not the only single one? Was that hard on him? Was it was it Very a tough hard. transition? Yep. And and that's um, it, it's really an interesting story. So when he first gets out, I'm helping him with his networking and, and getting into the right place and getting introduced to the right people. And he sees a job posted and he applies for the job and gets absolutely no response. It's just oh. ideal. It's a clinic manager job. Um, the, he's the interface between the doctors and the patients, between the doctors and the staff, between the doctors and the vendors. I mean, it's just ideal. It's what he did in the service. Not a single response. Job posting goes away. So he thinks, oh, I'm not going to get the job. Well, I happen to know somebody at the organization who knew about that job. Right. So I connected the two of them. So the job's no longer posted. Job's not been filled because they can't find the right candidate. I connect him. He gets the job, goes to the interview, gets the job. Right. Uh, eight months later, he calls me up and he says, Stu, this is, this is killing me, man. He goes, I'm just, I'm going crazy here. And this is a hard thing, especially for people who have been in service for a while, especially with people with significant responsibilities. First of all, you're in charge. And so when you say, I need you to do this, the expectation is the person you're talking to is going to do that. <laughs> and it doesn't Welcome work. Welcome to the civilian world. <laughs> you know, um, so the sense of urgency is not there. Um, the kind of the discipline that goes with the hierarchy that's in the military, a camaraderie, an understanding that, you know, my authority is up here on my shoulder or my collar. Yeah. And uh, I'm asking you to do something. I'm not asking you to question why I'm asking you to do something. So he struggled with that uh, quite a bit. And then eventually he called me up. He said, I'm done. He said, I had, you know, I had a blow up. That's oftentimes what happens. You know, I had a blow up, I had a conflict with somebody and, and I left. Right. right? So round two. So I say, okay, so let's talk about, you know, what worked, what didn't work. What would you do differently? What are you looking for? Well, I still want to do that. I said, okay, great. No problem. So this time it was a friend of mine who helped him get this next position. And there is a breach of ethics. And that's the other thing about being in the military that is difficult to understand about the civilian world is sometimes the rules are bent to benefit people or to protect people that doesn't happen in the military often. And when it right. does be, it's ferreted it out. And so um, there was the person that owned this group of clinics asked him to do something unethical and to, to do something that was clearly not the right thing to do. And he just said, you know, I'm out of here. Pound sand. Yeah. Now the good news. <laughs> oh, well, there's good news. Good. Oh, there's great news. He is an immensely successful small business owner. Oh, good. And Joel, here, yeah, Joel, here's a secret. 
it's leveraging what he needed from work, no matter what he was doing. Right. So he needed to be the decision maker, right? He needed to be in control of his environment. Um, because he was struggling a little bit with some PTS issues, he had to um, have time and flexibility to take care of himself. Right. Uh, mental health, going to the clinic, so on and so forth. So entrepreneurship was perfect. Now, when he left the service, he would have never have thought about being an entrepreneur ever. Right, right. Never he entered needed, his mind. He needed to go through his steps. Yep, he had to go through his steps. And yeah, you usually have to find somebody that can help you through it. Oh, yeah, that that's very true. Yeah. You've, you've mentioned networking a few times. Do you think that that's a key tool that they people need to learn when they're coming out of the military? That's the secret that ain't the secret. That's what I figured. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not only circled on my notes, but it's also starred. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give it a double star, brother. <laughs> and it's it's networking. Ne networking from a classic perspective, I think people think I just need to get somebody's name and phone number so I can call them and ask them for something. Right. That's not networking. No. Networking is getting together with a group of like-minded people and letting them know who you are, what you represent, you know, your persona, whatever the case may be. And some of the more successful networking um, experiences can be going to church, right? Yeah. being a coach on your kid's soccer team, um, you know, being a Rotarian or uh, a Kiwanis or, you know, some sort of social uh, group right? Civic minded group. Um, it's not just networking to get Joel's email so I can call Joel and ask him if he can help me. It's, yeah. it's working into a group of people and establishing a relationship with them. And he, here's the other secret in networking. You have to give more than you get. Right. Um, right. So to, to be honest, this is how we connected. So yeah. I didn't, I didn't actually reach out to you to be on the podcast. I'll just be oh. really honest with you. Yeah. I, just didn't. I had listened to the podcast before and a friend of mine had been on a, a podcast um, episode with you and he goes, he's a really cool guy. He's a neat guy. You ought to reach out and connect with him. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I did. And then you sent me the instructions for the podcast and I'm like, shit, I guess I'm committed. Now you're locked in. Now you're screwed. <laughs> but yeah. Nope. yeah. So like nope. you said earlier, it's just, it, it, it'll be cool to have this conversation because it helps us both. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you kind of, you nailed it on the head with the, the doing more or requesting less and, and actually doing more and helping out where I've seen a lot of people. And I think that's where they default is where, like you said, um, Hey, let me get his guy's email. Let me call him. He's going to give me a job. Then you do that. And then you get somebody like me on the other line is going to tell you to get bent. Because I don't know, I don't know you from a hole in the ground. You want me to get put you in a position where now I have to je not jeopardize, but I have to give you over basically the keys to the kingdom. And I, I, my concern is staffing. My concern is morale boost. My concern is a lot of things, financials. What are you going to offer me? Just because you're Stuart's best friend, that doesn't mean anything to me unless you can provide me with something that's more credible. And unless I know you better, and that's why you were saying like, you know, be on your kids, so be the coach of your kid's soccer team where all the parents come to you and they're talking and you're sharing stories and you're getting this, 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 um, this social vibe from people rather than a piece of paper at the end of the day, just with a bunch of digits and, and history of, about the person, right. Or the individual. Yeah. So I agree with you hundred percent. I think networking has always been key, especially in my industry in the security industry. I don't see why it wouldn't be in the military once you're leaving. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for veterans, we've got a little bit of advantage because we have this affinity. Right. So yep. I'll be honest with you. People send me LinkedIn connections all the time. Yep. The very first thing I do is look in their work experiences and see if they were in the military. That's that's number one. That's kind of like that, that threshold. Yep. If they're not, then I'm looking at their experiences and finding out if, if we have some affinity, I, somebody uh, sent me an invitation today and I always respond to the invitation with a message back to him. So this guy was a contributor to this book uh, that, uh, that gets released today. So it's 39 of us who have helped people with transition, uh, put together the, the secrets to these um, 
to this you know, successful military transition, right? So he sends me the invitation and I notice a couple things that we have in common. So the first thing is he's from Ohio. Yep. And so I always tell people, I if I ask you six questions, Joel, I'll bet you I can find how we're connected. Right. And a lot of times I can find that we know some of the same people. It's yeah. it's really freaky. It's really crazy when you start asking good questions. Um, yeah. And that's that's one of the most powerful things you can develop as a skill. And, and think about this, bud. Anything you can say, you can ask. Absolutely. So I'm going to say it again, just, just because it's one of the things I just live by. Anything you can say, you can ask. And all you have to do is put a who, what, where, when, why, or how on front of the statement that you're going to make. And what it does for you is it'll, it, it, it really does allow you to be in charge is kind of uh, in control of the conversation. Because once you ask person a question, it's almost impossible for them not to start thinking about the response and then responding. So what does that give you? Time. Yeah, time. Time to think and time to listen. Yeah. And 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 listen to what they're saying so you can find a common point of interest. It's one of the keys to networking is you know get your conversation going, get your exchange going and ask somebody like I did before the call with you. So how did yeah. you get started doing this? What's important to you about this podcast? And yeah. you know you told me your own personal story. That's powerful stuff now. Now you and I can connect because I can I have, I have empathy for you, dude. There, yeah. there are times when I get frustrated, disillusioned, and I get, you almost said the same thing, but I get a head fog, right? Like I can't, I know I should be able to think through this. I know my brain should be working faster, Yeah. but it's not for some reason. And the way I usually work myself out of it is I'll call somebody, right? Right. I'll get in a conversation with somebody and it'll get me get me out of it or I'll finish a task right, that's right. The thing in the job search. Um, your task is not to sit around perfecting your resume. I I've, I've had enough jobs and very few of them required the perfect resume. Some of them did require a resume, um, but not often of all the jobs that I've had, I've probably one actually required me producing a resume. But when I went through the TAP program, they would drill into, you know, it's got to be perfect and you got to send it to everybody and get their feedback. You know, what is cousin Johnny and Toledo, <laughs> you know, know about his resume? Yeah. And you get you get so much variability in the feedback. Well, I think this ought to be here, and maybe you should do this here. If you took all their advice, it would be a pile of crap. Right. I agree. You know, so I yeah. tell people, I say, get an 80 percenter, get something that's that 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 represents who you are and you feel good about and that somebody's edited it for you that's yeah. it just make sure your you know your microaggression periods are in the right <laughs> and, uh, yeah 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 patients correct and so on and so forth and then put it away because you might not ever need it mm -hmm. you might not ever need it the two jobs that i was telling you about that that my buddy um um got afterwards the only reason he had to have the resume the only time they ever looked at the resume was to put in his employment file after they had hired him right as a right. legal requirement yeah yeah so, we we have to do that it, here too. It an 80 percenter and then start working on your networking right um you said to ask questions do you think that that's something that um people that have been in the military for a long period of time have maybe a little bit of an issue with when they get out is asking questions because i hear a lot of stories where um it was just used it was just easier to be told what to do it was just easier to be told what to do yep. and now that they come out now they're faced with literally asking more questions than being told what to do yeah absolutely um and the the balance is you know you don't want to be like the old dragnet joe friday with a light in somebody's face asking <laughs> asking questions. Yeah. um but it is a it is a skillful art you know it because it's your practice yeah. it's an art to ask questions and it's an art to ask questions that are important to people so when you 
ask me a question about how to ask questions, I get pretty fired up about it because it's something I'm passionate about. Right. So you're listening, right? So you're listening and going, okay, wait a second. What does, what turns this guy on? So what's the importance of asking questions? Um, and I want to go back and I want to connect it to this asking questions piece. I want to go back to the, um, providing value and networking. I'm going to tell you another story. Sure. So this guy hooked up with me on LinkedIn and was completely honest with me on the invite and said, um, Hey, Stu, you don't know me from Adam, but here's my situation. You know, 25 years, 26 years, whatever it was, military command sergeant major, um, getting out of the service. And I've been through tap and I am freaking out. And I see that you help um, veterans transition. So I said, yeah, sure. No problem. I wasn't, I didn't have anybody at the time that I was working with. And I said, yeah, let's, let's make this connection. So we've never met. Right. We've talked one, once or twice on the phone. So I started giving him assignments. And so the first assignment was because he was so adamant about this resume. First assignment is I said, set your resume aside. I don't even want you to look at it for the next two weeks. He's freaking out about that assignment. And right. I said, you got to trust me. Just put it aside. Here's a second assignment. Do not apply for any jobs. And again, he's because it, th this information is a cognitive dissonance, right? It's just opposite of what he thinks he ought to be doing. Right. Yeah. Said, I'm going to give you something to do. And he goes, OK, all right, cool. I'll trust you. So I asked him, I said, what is your absolute passion? This is what I was talking to you. You know, that's that question. And he, you know, it was almost silence on the phone. And I could, you know, you, you know, you get that sense that somebody's thinking. And another cool technique is the first one to talk loses. So just shut up when you ask a question. Yeah. You know, let the silence work, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, so he goes, What do you mean? And then he said, Oh, I got it. And he gave me his what they call the elevator speech. Right. Which is that spiel, right? I'm a highly energetic, dynamic leader. Yeah, with yeah, yeah. Like, Shut up. Yeah. Right. That's not what I'm asking you. <laughs> what gets you up on Saturday morning when you don't have to work? What do you talk to your friends about? What's in your garage? You know, what's in your shop? And he's again, just a little slow to respond. And I know I got him thinking now. And he says to me, I love to ride motorcycles, dirt bikes. That's yeah. my thing. Right? Dirt bikes are my thing. And I said, okay, listen, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to show you how through LinkedIn, you can find people in your area who have the same affinity. So I showed him how to do that. You know, kind of you go through your contacts and then find those contacts. It's a little bit of a needle on a haystack look, but you can find them. Right. So he found a couple people. So he found, it's really interesting. He found um, a person who had just been uh, recognized for an article about dirt bike riding. Then he found somebody that was that sold dirt bikes that was in his area. And then he found somebody that serviced dirt bikes that's in their area. And I said, here's what you do. You call them up and you say, hey, listen, I don't, you know, I don't know you here. Here's who I am real quick. Um, I'm getting ready to leave the service and I'm very interested in motorcycles. I do not want a job from you. I am not calling you to get a job. I, I just want to hear from you about your experience in this field because it's something that I'm considering as a career field. And I don't know anything about it because I'm in the military for 26 years. Right. Most people will not refuse that request. And then the next thing is right. you close, close them with, and oh, by the way, I'll buy you lunch. Yeah. Right. But I also said, here's the other thing you need to do. Let them know what you can do for them. So when he talked to the person that had been recognized for the dirt bike article, he said, I do the same kind of writing. It was some kind of endurance trail writing kind of stuff. And I didn't even understand it, but that's what the article was about. And he said, I do some other things that you might be interested in writing about. Right. Now you're giving. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, when he talked to the mechanic guy, he says, listen, I've been working on bikes forever. I worked in them harsh environments. I've worked, you know, I've had them overseas with me. Um, I've traveled with them, I've transported them, and I've worked on them myself. Is there any problem that you've run into that you haven't been able to solve? Right. And the guy was like, yeah. And he said, I, I think I can help you with that. 
So immediately he's offering to buy them lunch and help them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So here's the fun part of the story. So he goes and he has lunch with all three of these people. It takes him about, I don't know, I gave him two weeks. I think he had it all done in five. And he calls me up and he says, hey, Stu, I've had these conversations. I said, well, what did you learn? He goes, I learned that I do not want to be in the motorcycle industry. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I've actually applied for sales jobs. And I talked to this sales guy. I wouldn't, I hate it. The guy's right. on the road all the time. The commissions are not great, blah, blah, blah. Okay, good. So I said, well, what did you learn? He goes, you're not going to believe this, but I have a job interview. I said, really? So who's the job interview with? He goes, the guy that was the mechanic, his wife works for a big company and they're looking for project managers. And I don't even know what the hell a project manager is. <laughs> I said, well, that's cool. So how did you get the, the interview? He goes, well, because I helped him with this problem, this technical problem that he was working on. He said, hey, I know my wife's working and she works for a company that's pretty military friendly. Would you like to at least go have lunch with her? Yeah. So I'm like, well, that's not really a job interview, but man, that's a great start, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he goes and lo and behold, here's what's happened. So the lady knows enough about him from the, the conversation that he had with her, her husband that she brings the HR person who's looking for project managers to the lunch. Wow. He's got a job offer at the end of lunch. He must have been sweating bullets. Yeah. And never produced a resume. That's fantastic. Right. And so now he goes in and, and here's the other cool thing. He knew somebody else who was a E7, E8, whatever it was, who was transitioning, um, who had the same skills and backgrounds that he did. He calls that guy and then helps the HR person. Now the HR person's got two jobs. Well, wow. He's been with that company. Gosh, I helped him back in, I don't know, 2012 maybe. And he's been with yep. the company ever since. So that's the, that's the secret, right? So in, in networking, it's, it, it's all about finding the, finding your passion, first of all. So don't take the first job you're offered. So yep. throw that rule out, right? Okay. Take the time to figure out what you're passionate about. Start talking to people who are similarly passionate about what you do. Provide them with something of value, something yep. you know, something you're willing to share. Um, and then start asking good questions and offer to buy them lunch and see where it goes. That's fantastic. Now you, you were talking about uh, companies that are very, um, they have a little bit of a veteran heart when it gives, when it comes to uh, hiring staff, what do you think of um, service members that are leaving uh, the military and looking for jobs? Do you think that it's wise for them to have a first kind of, how do I explain this? If if they want to go into the a field that they, that shows interest, do they go and look for veteran-owned businesses first, or should they like as a okay? I, I might have a better chance with this than I would said other company that maybe or maybe not speaks my lingo at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and ideally, you want to find a, a veteran-owned company that obviously you know shares the same passions. Um, and if their HR staff is also a veteran, that helps because sometimes human resource people, not intentionally, but unintentionally, right. um, don't, sometimes they're almost intimidated yep. by a military person coming in. Um, sometimes the hiring manager, think about this. A lot of HR people don't even hire. They're not the hiring decision yep. maker. It's no, the boss, right? The person yeah. you're going to work for. So you get, you know, you get a high speed, low drag, you know, fire breather <laughs> there and goes, Hey, you know, I can take on the world. There's nothing you can give me that I can't accomplish. Right. And the person is sitting there going, Holy crap. What am I going to do with this bird? If I hire them, yeah. right. The implication. Yeah. Um, here's some irony too. Um, this is a, this is an old term. So uh, back in the day, I don't know if you, you ever looked at Dr. Deming's work about quality, right? And we weren't not going to go too far down that path, but there's a term called soldiering and here's the irony of it. So soldiering was a term back when the industrial revolution was going on that basically said 
you know, when the new person would come on board on these assembly lines or production lines or whatever they were doing, they would come on with a lot of energy and enthusiasm and want to go like heck. So the line is making 10 widgets per hour. And the fire breather comes in there and is making 15 widgets an hour. Right. Making everybody look bad. Yeah. And so what the current line does is says, slow down, brother. Right. They only need 10 widgets from us. Yeah. You know? So, and it was called soldiering. Because yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The pressure put on that person to, to slow down and be in pace with the group uh, was far more important than improving the system. Right, so right. in modern days, you get young men and young women coming out again, fairly young, lots of experience, lots of knowledge, uh, lots of ability. And they come into a shop and the hiring manager is like, man, what do I do with this person? If they come in fired up, Yeah, you know, so finding a veteran owned shop is a great idea. Uh, finding maybe a veteran owned shop with an HR person that has some HR or veteran experience. Um, the other thing is, getting into veteran affinity groups. And I don't, I don't care what you pick. You can pick the VFW or the Legion. You can, you know, the, the couple of associations I belong to, um, the Chamber of Commerce I was in had a military affairs council. Um, I'm the incoming chair for the Florida Association of Veteran Owned Businesses on the Space Coast of Florida where I live. Yeah. Uh, you can, you know, you can't, my old man used to say, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting somebody that, you know, <laughs> espouses uh, being veteran friendly. Yeah. Um, I'd be a little cautious because some people are using it to their advantage, you know, 10% of them are using it to their yeah. advantage. Yeah. But for the most part, um, that's how you're going to, that's how you're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, now, when, when they're looking for jobs, when people are looking for jobs out of the military, are they looking for, like you said, don't pick the first one, but they're obviously looking for job security. So what in their mind, because they've just come from a job that was very secure yep. what are they picturing as job security after that yeah that's a great question so um and you know the the military is not as job secure as it used to be I right mean, right you, you know you're going to see um you you see the the military expand and contract and and so on and so forth so um if you want to spend 20 years and you're in the right career field and you make rank you know it is a um, a secure job and then you'll get some sort of retirement um, when you leave. And that's changed a lot too. Um, but I ask people to define what security means to them. Yeah. So operational definitions of words, Joel, are really critical. So if you say, I'm looking for security, I'm not going to say the first thing, oh, I've, I've got an idea. You know, you ought to go to work for another government agency because like the military, they provide security. That's the wrong way to look at it. The first question is, Joel, tell me what you mean by security. Right. You know, what's that mean to you? Um, are you looking for um, a, a stable industry? One that you know is going to be around for a long time? Are you looking for an organization that um, has a, um, like USAA, has a, uh, has a workforce that is long tenured? Um, are you looking for uh, compensation as a form of security. You're looking for benefits as a form of security. Do you want to stay in the same place? Right. Do you want to live right here? Is that what security means to you? So that's the first thing you got to get is get below the surface and ask them, you know, what security mean to you and then work from there. What kind of questions do you get from people that are joining, that are leaving the military? What are some of the three common ones that they have problems with? I, I think most of it is just unwrapping what they've learned and, and trying to get a hold of who they are. So when they're asking questions, it, it's usually really task focused. You know, how do I go about doing this? Where should I be looking? Who should I be getting a hold of? And that's very tactical kinds of stuff. You have to back up and begin to ask again. So what are you passionate about? What do you want to do for your near term and long term? Um, what are your interests? And I'll be honest with you, if you go on the web, there's so many free profile feedback things and TAP has these profile feedback things. You know, are you cut out to be an entrepreneur? Uh, would you make a good small business owner? Um, start to take those things, take those instruments and, and get the feedback, you know, take it with a grain of salt because you get what you pay for and they're free. <laughs> um, but they're, 
great questions. They're right. really good questions to think about. Um, the other thing too, and I think a lot of service members underutilize this resource is either your family members, you know, if you're married when you're in the military or your peers, you know, your NCOs and that kind of stuff, um, you're leaving the service, get some honest feedback from them. Right. And what do you think my strengths are? Um, what do you see me doing? Um, uh, if we met again in 10 years, what, what do you think I'd be doing? You know, cause I'll guarantee you this brother, nobody, when I went into the service that I met would be looking at me 30 years later and going, you know, I never thought. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be doing. So, um, getting feedback from people about what they think. And then the other thing is trying to imagine what makes you happy. Yeah. You Does know? when you ask them, okay, so when you're asking somebody, what do you want to be doing now? do you, does it scare them when you say, what do you want to be doing in 10 years? Because they're already fearful of the end of the military as it is for their career. Does it just give them that extra anxiety that, Oh, now I got to think about what I'm doing 10 years from now, as opposed to finding a job in eight months. Yeah. It's a, it's a fine balance. And I appreciate, you know, you kind of recognizing that you're trying to ask questions that are purposeful, that aren't driving fear, but you do need to get people thinking about, what do you think you would be doing? Right. Uh, when I left the service, I, it, it, I was very for, fortunate in the military. So even though I served in wartime, I never deployed to combat. Mm. It's just one of those things, right? Yeah. So Panama, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Bosnia, all that crap happened. I yeah. just happened to be in a unit that had another assignment. So never deployed to co uh, combat, previous civilian experience. Married to another service member, stable family, marriage, kids, the whole nine yards. Right. But what I found out when I was on active duty is how much training and development of others turned me on. Just got me fired. Right. 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 So I taught at an NCO academy, and then I taught the instructors at the NCO academy. And that led me to this idea of facilitation, because believe it or not, back in the early 90s the army was a very early adopter of this idea of facilitation yeah. and that was the process of designing learning experiences where it's student-centered where you're trying to get the student to lead where they need to go by asking them questions and so i just happened to fall into that and when i left the service i went to work for the department of veterans affairs and started working with guys who are veteran service officers in the field. And we had two long-term uh, care facilities. And so that's where my passion for helping veterans really got ignited. So what happened was I combined those things. So when I left the service, I went to work for the department of veterans affairs as a training and development specialist. Right. And, and what they say is the rest of it is history. So my stumbling around and just reflecting on, so how did I do it has helped me help others do it. So if you're in the service and you're, um, let's say you're an aircraft mechanic uh, and, and so you're getting out of the service and somebody says, well, why don't you just go work with aircraft? Right. Call Boeing. Yeah. Call Boeing. You know, yeah. So that is one path you could take, but I would ask them, what did you like about working on aircraft? Right. Uh, it could be as, 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 as the thing I liked most was diagnostic the diagnostic side, right? Diagnosing problems that no one else could solve. Well, there's a ton of jobs where that's applicable. Right. And if you put the mechanical skills to it, you might be going to work for SpaceX instead of Boeing. You know, you might, yeah. there's a young kid that getting ready to leave the service and he's a, uh, it's called a 15 Tango. So he's an aircraft, um, um, Black Hawk um, mechanic. And he likes how things work. So in talking with him, he's going to leave the service and become a turbine mechanic. Right. Has nothing to do with helicopters. No. But getting to understand what do you like doing, you know, because there are people that are better at thing work and there are people that are better at people work. Right. And getting, getting those two delineations will really, you know, help people. Just like my buddy never thought he was going to be a small business owner, but he is. Right. Right. Um, and we're, we're talking about the, the anxiety of finding jobs and, and interviews and everything else. 
Is there any uh, advice that you can give people that when they're going into the interviews, how to prepare themselves, uh, not just physically, but mentally? Uh, to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you're going to have to forgive me. I'm usually very good with this kind of stuff. I just ran across this organization that's veteran focused. In fact, I'll provide it for you after the podcast. So people have absolutely. Asked. Yep. That they have volunteers that do mock interviews with you and then give you feedback on that. Right. So there have been organizations out there now that are helping people with the interview process. And I think for the veteran who's transitioning, because these are volunteers, that the service is free. You right. know, well worth it. I'll make sure you get it, Joel, because right. it's a, it was really it was really compelling and it's an interesting it's just a it's one of those kind of made up words organizations. Yeah, no. But yeah, do you do you have any advice for people to kind of prepare themselves for that type of situation yourself? Things that have worked for you and other people you've spoken to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's uh, it's like any task. Most people have the skills to do it, but they have to have the confidence to do it. Right. I you know I know you shoot right. Yep. Yep. So has there been a, a day on the range where you're better than other days? Sure. <laughs> Usually every day I try to get better, but yes, hundred percent. There are days where you are better than the other day. Yep. And so um, what's the difference? Because you, you have the same skills that you did yesterday. Confidence. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And confidence comes from practice. Yeah. And, and, that, and then you got to add feedback. So right. if, if you're practicing without feedback, if you're just doing the interview in your head or doing it with your, you know, dog, it's not going to get you. You yeah. got to find somebody who's, who's willing to do it. Here, here's another technique that I've, I've had people do. Um, connect with somebody who knows an HR professional who yep. for free lunch and connect that person with the HR professional and have them go to lunch and have them do an interview at the table. I don't want to work for your company, right? But I just want to have an opportunity to be in front of an HR professional. And if I answered a question this way, what kind of feedback would you give me? Oh, by the right. way, I'm going to your lunch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That would work. Fantastic. Actually, it's funny that it's funny that you bring up these, um, these, these social interactions with people because I never, I guess I, I don't really think of the, the, the physical portion of it, like, because we were in such a digital age, right? So when, when, when you're dealing with, uh, HR, like you said, sending in resumes, you're, you're calling on the phone, you're, you're, you're questioning maybe the admin person, then you're following up with the HR again. There's no real social interaction until the actual interview itself. But what you're telling, what you're saying is, you know, when you're out networking, let's get together with these people. Let's start being more social and, and, and bringing out the, the part of you that, 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 that you want everybody to see as opposed to the digital version that we see on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever it is. Yeah. Very important. And obviously you see my paradigm too, because, because of COVID, it's gotten even more challenging to network oh, yeah. this yeah. way. So a lot of what I'm, I'm, I coach people on, you now have to do virtually. Yeah. And and you can do it. And there's also techniques. I, I mean, you, you've got the green screen behind you, right? You've got the mic. You sent me that cool link that said, hey, when you prepare, do these things. Yeah. That's all good advice for virtual networking. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I purposely... You can see it. You can see how my background, how I'm centered on everything. Yeah. That is like deliberately purposeful. Right. Because when people look at me, I want to have a, a, a certain persona. And right. so um, I've, I've set up my office in order to do that. And it, it's important to do uh, uh, when you're having to do a lot of work virtually. Right. And how do you think that people are taking to that now after COVID? Do you think that uh, people that are exiting the military now have that opportunity to really understand the technical uh, advantages that they may or may not have? Yeah, I think so. I think the service is highly technical. It's um, it, it's it, it's specifically technical. Um, you know, some of our uh, warfighting operators have some of the best tech. You know, this some of the best technologies and tools and so on and so forth. Um, when you're in, you know, the Air Force and the Navy in particular. Um, they're very technology strong. Right. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of airmen and um, Navy personnel are exposed to pretty high end technology tools. 
And, you know, for what it's worth, anybody under the age of 30 has, has grown up on this stuff. You got to remember when I, seriously, when I was first, I got my first computer when I was in the military. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I typed my undergraduate work on a typewriter. Right. Right. Now, and I don't think I'm that old, but it's no, no technology has changed so much. No, but it's just within the, the generation every year that the, the gap has been there. Now, if you, if you would have had my, had this conversation with my son in 20 years, you would have been a very different level, right? But yep. but we have that generational gap that understands the transition that had already happened. There was times when I had, I mean, I was, uh, what was I, 10 when the first computer came out. So I was not even used to it either. But right. you know, I, I completely understand where you're coming from. Is there a big difference? And this will be my final question before I ask you um, a few other, another one. But um, do you think that um, there has been a, process forward for people leaving the military now as there was 10 years ago is it a lot easier and is there more information that is given to a a service member with the successful goal of um having a career after the military yeah i think you know technology is part of that joel and and also awareness uh, people are beginning to see the value what we, what we call the value of a veteran yeah. um and there's a lot of affinity programs. And like I said, you you know, just type in veteran and see all the stuff that comes up. So yes, right. that's all good stuff. Um, I still do think that we short change service members. We, we spend more time and effort getting them into the service, oriented to the service, trained in the service, than we do getting them out of the service. Right. Um, and unfortunately, there are branches of the services that are worse than others. So if I'm working with, um, you know, a specific branch, I know there hasn't been as much time effort um, in that. And, and here's the other thing. Unfortunately, our warfighters, our combat arms folks, they're even more shortchanged. Right. Because the perception is you've got skills that nobody needs or wants in the civilian community. And the opposite is true. Right. So, right. Um, I was working with a kid um, that that got a hold of me and he, you know, combat arms guy. And like you, he had a great interest in guns. And so when I worked with him, got him a job up the street at one of the local, you know, at Caltech, at one of the manufacturers, um, he was a combat arms guy. So that was kind of a natural thing. Right. But I also had combat arms folks come out and have the leadership skills and like to run a small shop, I, a, a guy I helped become a chef, right? Because it was that fast paced environment. You got to get it out. You got to get it out. Right. You got to get it out on time. Right. Um, a lot of times I think combat arms folks uh, are really kind of short changed in that way. Um, and plus there's a perception um, that is not accurate that, that combat arms folks, especially special operators are going to be a problem. Right. I, I did want to talk about the stigma, but I didn't want to kind of lead down that road. But I, I, I do see it quite a bit, especially like you said, special forces. It's almost like their only means is well, some type of grunt work. And that's not fair. Right. Yeah. Or, or law enforcement or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And it yeah. may be that that's what they want to do. But there's a lot of other opportunities for folks that are have been in those very stressful situations, high demand situations to to go out and become a gym owner to go out and become right. a chef, go, go out and, you know, uh, start to make guns, you know, whatever they're going to do. So, right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Can you tell our uh, listeners where they can find you, where they can, and obviously talk about the book and everything else? Yeah, absolutely. So the book was just released today on Amazon. I want to get my information correct. So I'm going to get, uh, very get exciting, my, get my old man eyes on there. <laughs> and, uh, Eric Wright, who's a very good friend of mine, is the person that put this project together. He has a company called Vets to PM. He's just a super guy. So the book on, on Amazon, and it's you know the unbelievably expensive price of $9.95. Oh, geez. 39 <laughs> of us. Now think about this. So yeah. the folks on this podcast have the benefit of one guy. There's 39 people like me who have stories just like mine about how to do this successfully. Right. So the title is 101 Lessons Learned Helping Military Members and Veterans Achieve Meaningful, Lucrative Post-Service Careers. And I'll, I'll send you the link 
on it and you can put it on the on the podcast link but it's it's uh um knowing some of the people that have contributed to it it's just going to be an absolute um amazing book right and the invitation's there for people who listen to this and say hey i'm going to call this guy on his stuff right and so um i do everything i do in this area just on my linkedin profile so it's just linkedin but it's my name s-t-u-a-r-t s-m-i-t-h and then yep. the letter c charlie papa foxtrot so stuart smith at cpf on linkedin and people can link in with me and i'd be more than happy to help them uh, the link to that book is on there um there are um and like i said i, I i'd be happy to to help anybody who's willing to do the work to transition successfully because that's that's what we're supposed to do